Education Resources of Ontario, the Center for Equitable Library Access, uh, the National Network for Equitable Library Service, or NELS, and uh, the CNIB Foundation, and uh, Provincial Resource Center for the Visually Impaired. Had a lot of fun working together and are pleased to deliver this series of events during the month of January in celebration of World Braille Day. Uh, and now recognizing that we are a national, if not international audience, um, uh, we'll uh, acknowledge our traditional territory, uh, the World Day planning organizations, acknowledge the historical oppression of land, cultures, and original peoples in what we now know as Canada. We respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land, and will continue to honor the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty we have made to Indigenous nations and peoples. Please take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which you live, work, and play uh, where you are today. Thank you. So um, a couple of housekeeping things just before we begin and before I ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, just some, some Zoom etiquette pieces. Um, as with all online conferences, we can follow good etiquette by keeping yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Um, and so that's either in the bottom left corner of your iPhone screen, Alt-A on a PC, Option-A on a Mac, um, raise hand features, uh, double tap your name in the participants list on an iPhone or touch display. Um, Alt-Y is the keystroke on a PC, Option-Y on a Mac. Um, and then as I believe Rianne has just noted in the chat, um, there are some specific keystrokes uh, for um, uh, screen reader users uh, quickly performing tasks and functions related to um, notifications. Uh, and so as we've um, as we've we've uh, we've learned already today, um, and I've actually learned some of these myself. Um, Alt S, Alt Windows S, uh, enables or disables the automatic speaking of alerts. Um, Alt Windows A repeats uh, the most recent alert, uh, and then there are other commands that uh, I'll leave, leave you to read at your leisure in the chat uh, that may help with um, your experience of our panel today. So without further ado, we're going to get right into it, everyone. Uh, we're so delighted to be joined by a, a diverse range of speakers, uh, both with lived experience and representing um, uh, representing uh, service providers in accessibility services at the post-secondary level. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to go through uh, just in the order that you appear in my Zoom list because, you know, we're, we're on virtual meeting rules here. Uh, and so first uh, in my list is uh, Ashley Shaw. Good morning, Ashley. Good morning, Adam. Thank you for having me. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and where what brings you to our panel today? Of course. So um, as Adam mentioned, my name is Ashley Shaw, uh, and I am a master's student in the community psychology program at Wilfrid Laurier University, which is located on uh land covered by the, the Haldeman Treaty and the Haldeman Tract um, and Waterloo Region in Ontario. Um, I am also a board member with Braille Literacy Canada and um, an analyst for Vision Loss Rehabilitation Canada. Um, and I have, I'm, I'm sort of nearing the end of my graduate degree um, and some years ago uh, did my bachelor's degree um, at the same uh, at the same university. So I um, I'm a Braille user. I've been a Braille user since early childhood, and those are the experiences I bring today. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley. Next on my list is uh, Jen Golden. Hi, Jen. Hi, Adam. Um, I Well, Adam got the intro started for me. I'm Jen Golden. I am actually the uh, past past president of Braille Literacy Canada, and I'm the current chair of the Braille Authority of North America and involved in the International Council on English Braille, so kind of sensing a, a Braille pattern there. Um, I, in terms of education, because that's what we're here to talk about, I have a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Ottawa, which I uh, obtained in the 1990s. And then recently I did some graduate studies at Carleton, also in linguistics. So I will talk a little bit about that experience as well. And I currently work for a software company called Crawford Technologies. Great. Thanks so much, Jen. Uh, next on my list, I have uh, Leticia. Good morning, Leticia. Good morning, Adam. Um, so um, my name is Leticia Famobani, and today I'm speaking from Delta, BC. 
Um, I work for NELS as an accessibility tester and also as a digital specialist for the Rick Hansen Foundation. I hold a couple of degrees in math and philosophy and um, applied, poli applied policies from the University of Sherbrooke. Thanks, Letitia. And I should also mention I'm joining you today from the Pacific Time Zone, which is why I'm saying good morning when I should be saying good afternoon to you, Nancy. Hi. Hi, Adam. Um, so I'm Nancy Waite. Um, I'm the coordinator for Library Accessibility Services at McMaster University. Um, I've been in this position for 10 years, um, but I've worked at McMaster for 20, about 25. Um, so I, I live and work um, in McMaster, or, sorry, in Hamilton, um, which is the traditional territory of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee people. Um, this land is protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. It's an agreement to take only what you need, leave some for others, and keep the dish clean. Um, while we've broken this covenant in the past, I hope that reconciliation brings us back to this agreement, concern for each other and the land. Um, I hope that, um, or I'm looking forward to participating in this, this conversation. Uh, we had a chance to talk on Monday, and um, I'm looking forward to, to talking again today. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to all of our panelists. So um, we have quite a range of uh, of topics and questions to cover. As Nancy mentioned, we we met on Monday, and um, uh, really looking forward to continuing the dialogue here with 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 all of our attendees today. Um, so our first panel relates to uh, positive experiences, and so for our um, for our learners, uh, our our post secondary learners, or uh, now former post-secondary learners, um, I'll, I'll ask the question, um, what was a good experience that you had, uh, maybe one, even one that surprised you in terms of an accessible learning experience in your, um, in your, in your post-secondary career? Um, and then we'll uh, rephrase that slightly for Nancy. Um, and for Nancy, a request that you received that you were able to accommodate that was unexpected or, or surprising. Uh, and so we'll go in the same order as as before. Uh, so Ashley, I'll put the the this, this first question to you. Thank you, Adam. Um, so you know, I've, I've my uh, my undergrad degree. I initially started it almost twenty years ago, um, and so things have kind of changed a lot <laughs> over the past couple of decades. But and I've had a lot of surprising and and sort of memorable experiences. Um, but the one experience that uh, that that I always remember fondly is um, happened during the the final year of my undergrad degree. Um, so I was taking a lot of seminar classes, which are, of course, like smaller classes where um, the students in the class facilitate most of the um, discussions and learning and conversations uh, guided by their professor. And so there's a high volume of reading and um, there are usually kind of a high volume of notes and handouts and things like that, that students produce for, for one another each week, depending on who's facilitating. And so after the first couple of sessions that, that we went through this with me kind of scrambling around trying to, trying to find what we were talking about um, uh, when I didn't have access to the, to the handouts uh, that were being provided, um, the rest of my cohort in the seminar um, figured out where on campus they needed to go in order to get someone to um, emboss their prepared materials in Braille ahead of time. Um, and then for the rest of the semester, um, someone, one of the facilitators for that for that week went that day and picked materials up and brought them. So when they were handing out materials to the rest of the class, they, they provided mine in addition as well. Um, and this was just, you know, sort of surprising to me because it had never, it had never happened before. Um, and they, they, you know, these students had put sort of more effort into the process than a lot of faculty members had. Um, and, but also just, you know, we were studying the sociology of education and equity in education and to kind of watch people start to put those um, principles into practice was, was a really valuable experience. Great. Thank you, um, Ashley. Love that that authentic kind of putting things into practice. Uh, now to Jen, a positive experience that comes to mind. Sure. Well, um, 
I, I had several, but the one that came to mind first when I first when I first read this question happened to me, uh, I believe it was my second year. And as I said earlier, I did uh, linguistics degrees, which is the science of language with so all kinds of things, which I don't have time to get into. But as an elective, I chose to as electives, I chose to study uh, some languages as well. And uh, it was my German textbook. I was trying to um, get a hold of the German textbook that my class was using. And I ended up, and I don't even think this is why I went there, but I went, I was at the the main library at Ottawa U and I ended up talking to somebody in interlibrary loan. And I do still remember her name, but I'm not going to say it. But I didn't expect her to help me get my book because she had nothing to do with accommodating students with disabilities. And somehow we just got on to that and she offered and she found the textbook for me in Braille. And she even went to the extent of driving, I don't know, it was like 20 volumes of Deutsch Oite to the apartment where I lived. And I just, she went above and beyond and she was helpful in other situations as well. But it was just a surprise to me because that was not her role at all. Great. Thanks, Jen. Um, Leticia, same question to you, a, a positive experience that stands out. I did have a few, and the one that really stick with me is the class exemption that I got uh, by the end of my bachelor's degree. Um, when I started my degree in applied policies, there were this um, mandatory course called I think, statistics in politics. And the course has lots of visuals. So the university was not able to accommodate me because they could not transcribe everything. They could not. They just could not accommodate me. So after three weeks, I had to withdraw from the class. And then with my professor help, I made a request to be exempted from the course because if I could not take the course, if I could not pass the course, then I, I, I would have not been able to, to graduate. At first, my request was not granted. It was denied. And no one could explain to me why. So it took literally three years really to be accommodated finally to get the exemption. But each semester I kept, you know, requesting the same thing. And my professor was helping me. At, at the end of my second last semester, I just went online to check my exam results just to find out that I, I just got, you know, the ex, um, exemptions, which meant I was, in, you know, it was a surprise to me because I was thinking maybe I would not be able to graduate without this course being removed from my list of mandatory classes. But at the, at the end, it was granted and it was, uh, I was able to graduate one semester later. Thanks, Leticia. That must have been a relief uh, to yeah, you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> and Nancy, um, from your perspective. Yeah, um, so there's two that I can think of. Um, the first one um, was a partnership with the McMaster Museum of Art. Um, they had approached us. Um, it was a collaboration with a couple of students that had, I, I guess, actually had approached them initially. Um, and they wanted to create Braille versions of a couple of their pieces. Um, so they had selected a couple of pieces that they thought would work. Um, and then I had um, kind of revised those works. Um, and we were able to produce, I, I believe it was three or four uh, pieces in Braille, in tactile Braille. Um, we have a, a Braille embosser that will um, Braille, like different le levels of Braille cells, um, depending on the, um, the intensity of the color. Apologies, we have dogs. And, and as soon as you close the door, they have to come in. Um, so if you're you're watching this, um, they're anyway. Um, so so with the the images, we were able to create a tactile version of um, of those art pieces, um, and, and it was something that was on display for for several months. Um, and the students that had approached were able to participate in the same um, art exhibit that um, the the rest of the class was. Um, so that I thought was um, a really interesting experience and it wasn't something that I had, um, I, I don't know, it was surprising to me. Um, and then the other one would have probably been the uh, first student that we had that, um, with, uh, first Braille reader that we had, um, and it just the volume of work that we were able to produce. Um, the student was um, in a math class and we were working with, with Bob and Arrow 
um, and his, his team at Arrow. Um, and this was quite complex tactile braille that the student was reading. Uh, we were producing maybe about 20 um, math graphs per week. Um, and with, with our team of uh, four student assistants, we were able to actually produce that volume of work, which kind of surprised me that um, with the first student that we were working with, we were able to produce this work. Um, and he was able to get the courses that he needed um, and we were able to, to help the student out. So that, um, I don't know, that surprised me. Like, I think if we'd started with just one course or um, maybe not math braille, um, I think we would have maybe not been you know what it wouldn't have been a surprise but yeah i thought we we you know did something you know pretty pretty significant to jump right in the kind of the deep end and you know um the volume of work right so that would thank, be it thank you nancy and welcome to our four-legged panelists as well on your <laughs> apologies end. no no that's fine we love love every all those furry friends um okay i was thank you all for that for that first response i was just reminded um that in my haste to get us started here, I didn't mention our protocol around questions. Um, we've developed a series of questions for our panelists that all interweave. And so our hope is to um, have our panelists respond to those questions and then uh, time permitting towards the end of our time, uh, of, our, of our time together, um, uh, opening things up for questions. So just wanted to acknowledge that. If, however, you do have something related to uh, 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 something that a speaker has just said, please throw that in the chat and we'll address those uh, chronologically as we, uh, as we go through the presentation this morning. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you, Bob, for the reminder. Second question relates, is a two-parter. So uh, what advice would you give to faculty or to future Braille reading students to make their university, uh, to make the experience of students better. So in your response, I would ask you to um, just break it down for us and uh, clarify whether your advice would be directed to faculty or to students or both, um, just so that we can kind of keep those two threads uh, separate. So Ashley, uh, I'll ask, I'll come to you first. Uh, what advice would you give to faculty or to future Braille reading students to make uh, for a better university experience for the students? Um, so I'm going to just kind of frame my my response by saying that like the, the, the two factors that are most important to remember for both groups, for both faculty and students, and for really for any kind of actor in this process, is are kind of the time factor and the complexity factor. Um, so I'll talk to to students first. Um, for, for students, remember that the um, part of the timing issue is going to be something that that um, that that you have some agency over. So um, and what I'm what I'm talking about is kind of being very, very organized about when you know certain things are going to be happened. You won't be able to anticipate everything, but a lot um, a lot of things you will you will know ahead of time. So, you know, when you're registering for courses for the year, which in most institutions kind of happens in, during the during the previous kind of spring summer term, um, you're you're going to have a sense of which courses you're taking and when in the year you're taking them, and it's important to communicate that information right away and start planning right away um, to you know, to acquire materials in any kind of alternate format, but this is particularly important when it comes to Braille because there's some some time, some extra time involved um, in, you know, getting Braille that's that's produced correctly and, and getting all the kind of um, fancy, exciting things that, um, that, that folks like Nancy and her team uh, work on. And so the other factor to remember is just the complexity. So there's your your materials may be coming from different places. You may have to connect with different folks throughout your post-secondary institution. So that could be um, you'll probably have to connect with your professors or your or your kind of faculty members. Um, you may have to connect with other folks from your department. So there may be like a program coordinator that you have to connect with, who may be able to kind of help you plan out when you're taking which courses and what you know what sorts of things are going to materials are going to be required for those courses um there may be different types of accessibility services that work differently at your institution versus mine and so part of your role especially if you're a new student um, or if you're new to alternate formats is going to be figuring out 
that landscape and who who had <clears throat> who has each role in in terms of getting you um, getting materials transcribed or getting you access to materials or what the what the process will be whether you know whether you need to find out what those materials are for them or whether you need to kind of connect them with uh with with the courses that you're taking and 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 they'll figure it out from there because it's just so different at different institutions um for faculty members the one main point around time that i want to kind of emphasize is that because it takes time for um, teams like the one that that Nancy represents to kind of gather their materials and and produce uh, quality braille. Um, something like you know deciding the week before the semester starts what course materials you're going to use is very very frustrating and causes a great deal of um, anxiety, stress, um, kind of overwork among lots of lots of folks. Um, it results in you know students not having any of their materials until partway through a semester and then having to do a sort of rush to the finish line um things like that and a lot of that you know the students are often doing our best we're trying to prepare ahead of time we're contacting you ahead of time other folks you know working at the institution accessibility staff are contacting you ahead of time and there's a reason that we're doing that so we understand that you know academic freedom is very important and you know departmentally sometimes we don't know who's teaching courses until the last second but it is very very vital that you figure out what course materials you're going to be requiring as soon as possible when uh one of us approaches you great thanks ashley appreciate that emphasis on the timeliness piece um, Jen, over to you. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Um, just to, to add along with that, I would say to students that you are your own best advocate. So a lot of us in high school maybe had people who made sure that we had the stuff that we needed. And it's, a, it's different in university and it depends. It varies from campus to campus. But I would say do the best you can to know what you need and be able to articulate that because you're always going to be your own best advocate and i will say that that ability that i developed particularly in university has served me well to this day so it's 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 also sort of a skill that will help you throughout your life you'll you'll always need it um the other thing i i would just add to that is don't assume anything about what's going to be provided um, you may be told, oh, sure, sure, this will happen and that'll happen. But just be, again, be very proactive and make sure that what's promised to you is actually coming. And then uh, just one point that I would maybe make for faculty is that students um, who are blind or partially sighted or low vision, when they come to you, their issue isn't that they, you know, it's not that we can't understand the course material, it's that we can't access it. And that's a really, really important distinction. I, I didn't have to explain this often, but I did have a couple of professors where I needed to say, no, no, I'm not having trouble in your course. I understand what you're teaching. I'm not, you know, that's not the issue. The issue is that I just simply cannot read the print textbook that we're using. So that's a really important distinction for faculty to understand. Thank you, Jen. Um, Leticia, to you. So I will speak to students first. I kind of have the same answer as <clears throat> Jane, because this is something I learned the hard way. I wish I've learned how to advocate for myself by the time I enter university, because only the student knows exactly what they need. No one can truly decide for them. So it's really important to articulate what you need and maybe why you need it, and request it and insist this is what I need. If you need Braille, uh, your course materials to be in, you know, transcribing Braille, say it because other students have access to both electronic version and hard copies of the uh, course materials if they need. And for a student who is blind or visually impaired, Braille means hard copy. So they should not be denied the opportunity to read in the format that they need. It's so important to say it. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell students is plan ahead so that you don't end up getting your course material in March when the class, the course started in January. So plan ahead, register on time and forward your request on time because many a times you register last minute and you, you know, you request your, um, to get your 
access like um, alternative format and then you get it like for four weeks before the end of the semester, you don't have enough time to study. So at the end of the day, even if you got a B or B plus, you didn't ha have, you were not able to be your best self in terms of studying and, you know, and scoring the best grade because you didn't ha have four months to study like everyone else. You have only like four weeks or six weeks to do. So it's really important to plan ahead and to faculty or professors, communication is so important. When you have a student who has a um, disability or let's say who's blind or visually impaired, just sit down with them, communicate, try to understand the need. There is no need to send them back to uh, disability services because most of the time, these are not teachers. They don't really understand, they're not, they're not professors. They don't really understand how the course is structured. Only the professor can truly help the student, uh, the student in his class, mm -hmm. not, uh, uh, any other advisor in disability services. So communication is so important to try to know what the students need and provide them with the accommodations that they need. If you can't accommodate them, then communicate with uh, uh, disability services instead of just sending them, go there and then, oh, come back, what well, they said this and this other person said this. It's so uh, stressful for the student and they don't have to go to that each semester and for each uh, course. Thank you, Leticia, so important. Um, so switching gears a bit, Nancy, from, from your perspective, um, what advice would you give faculty or students or, or both uh, in terms of improving the student experience? Um, I, I think that really Ashley, Jen and Leticia nailed it. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the timeliness of it is so critical, um, both from the student perspective and the instructor perspective. Um, without the, um, the course outline from the instructors, we really can't provide any um, textbooks or, or um, lecture slides or anything like that to the, the student. Um, so in for the instructors, you know, providing that information as soon as possible, definitely not on the first day of class um, for textbooks and for for class class notes. You know, I, I understand that instructors do have a lot going on, um, but providing lecture slides ahead of time so that we can convert them into Braille um, so that students can follow along in class like the other students in class is essential. Like that's that's equality, um, that's accessibility. You know, it's it's essential for, for all students to have access to the same content. And I understand that it's it's an inconvenience, um, but it's also not, it's not right for every, for all students not to have the same content. Um, and then for students, um, the communication aspect. Um, if something works better for you, let us know. Um, we had a student a couple of years ago that um, wasn't a regular Braille reader, but Braille worked better for certain circumstances. So they came and said, um, you know, for them, expanding the Braille cells worked better so that they could kind of discern the different um, different Braille cells. Um, and so we did that. We just kind of worked that into our process and we just made everything expanded. Um, and just kind of like that level of communication, hey, this works better. Um, this, you know, like this graph, um, I can I can understand this, but can you do this differently? Or, you know, just just that kind of communication, especially at the beginning, is really helpful because we can kind of individualize um, our process because we don't have like it's not like we have a hundred braille readers um we have i think at most we have six and we can really individualize the process for each student um so you know like that type of communication but also you know when you register for a course let us know but if you drop a course also let us know thank you nancy a lot of common threads through everyone's responses um before we move on to the next question um I just also want to acknowledge um, that uh, Karen from Sila is actually tweeting uh, some of our responses. So if you're on Twitter and following along there, um, those will be coming through the uh, the Sila uh, account. And so thank you, Karen, for for doing that. 
Jen um, and Ashley and, and Leticia, in in one way or another, I think that each of your answers really reflected or or kind of hinted at the transition from from high school and or from secondary school into the post secondary uh, in experience. And so, our third question relates to that transition piece. So, um, how would you describe your transition from high school to post secondary? And so, first to you, Ashley. Um, so if I had to summarize my transition, which again was about, you know, 20 years ago, um, I graduated from high school in 2004 and that's when I first kind of left home and did the whole moving into a dorm and et cetera, et cetera. That was, that was my straight from, from high school to post-secondary, uh, experience and it could have been better, but it also could have been worse. Um, so there were, there were pieces that worked out really well, you know, through kind of, they were pieces that I couldn't really particularly anticipate. And the main one was that I happened to end up at my university at a time when there were another kind of cluster of, of blind and visually impaired students um, going through their undergrad at this university at the same time. Um, that's not necessarily something that you can plan for or something that's, that's going to happen. Um, but it, sort of, you know, taught me the value of, of mentorship, of just having um, folks who were a few steps further along in the process whom I could follow. Um, a lot of times they were giving me information directly, but a, a other times it was just the opportunity to, to, the, sorry, the opportunity to observe the way that they handled uh, their, their situations. And again, they were all in very different programs from each other and from, from mine. Um, and so different things worked differently depending on what, what our course of study was. Um, but there were so many things that they, that they taught me from, you know, how to get support and assistance in a self-serve dining hall to, you know, which admin staff knew kind of who would be teaching courses the soonest to, um, you know, how to fill out paperwork for kind of funding for assistive technology to just all of these different little pieces that become part of your life um, when you transition to post-secondary. So that was very valuable. Um, what I wasn't prepared for was some of the kind of capacity building that I that I had to go through um, around that time. And what I mean by that is, you know, I had I had been taught that self advocacy was important. Um, I was taught that growing up in the in the K to twelve school system. Um, but a lot of things, just because of the nature of, of how that system differs from the post secondary system, were were happening under the hood that I didn't know about it, and so I was unprepared. So I was unprepared for you know, the process of how notes, like lecture materials, those sorts of like in-class materials were going to kind of go from the instructor to to myself um, because that process sort of happened between teachers and, and special education staff in the, in the, in the high school system. Um, I wasn't prepared for, you know, where textbooks were going to be coming from. Um, the fact that I was going to have to, you know, the way our system worked was you would pay for a textbook, you would submit proof that you paid for the textbook, and then the you know, some other process would happen behind the scenes um, to try to get you an accessible copy of that textbook. Um, I didn't know how any of that would go um, because, you know, I just in high school, you know, textbooks showed up in print for the sighted students and textbooks showed up in Braille for me. Um, and so, again, a lot of this is not because, you know, people hadn't been diligent about explaining to me that I had to, you know, communicate my needs to others, but I just didn't realize how many people I needed to communicate with, how much extra paperwork I was going to have to do on the side, you know, when I wasn't actually studying and, and, and writing papers and things like that, um, how many different pieces of how the institution worked, I would have to know, like, that I would have to become kind of this mini expert on all of the different roles within different types of kind of accessibility services or um, other accommodations that I that I needed, as well as my own department and my own faculty. Um, just all of those pieces function so differently from how they function in post sec or sorry in uh, in secondary education that um, it's something that students need kind of more explicit training to understand. Great, thank you, Ashley. Um... So Jen, over to you. Same same question around your transition from high high school to post secondary. Um, maybe some things that you felt well prepared for, and maybe some things where you felt maybe a little less prepared. Yeah, I I would say it was a very challenging experience. I want to say particularly the first semester uh, until I sort of got into a pattern and figured out how I was going to handle things. I had been 
um, and I was debating if I should say this, but in September of this year, it will be 30 years that I began my undergrad. So obviously things have changed a lot, um, even likely at the university I attended, but I was led to believe that, oh yeah, everything's just taken care of. You give us your list of courses, we'll get the books, they'll be, you know, they'll be transcribed, everything's good to go. I arrived to find out that they didn't really think I'd ac I actually intended to take five courses. I probably only wanted three. Um, and so they kind of worked on those courses, but didn't really have the material. And I, that, that's not a good way to start out the semester to walk in and find out that you have basically no textbooks. And so I did not make a lot of headway with the services that were available. And so my response was basically, all right, I'll take care of it myself. So I was used to taking my own notes. I had all through high school. So I took my own notes. I met with my professors. I talked to them about what I needed. I dealt with the student services um, and, you know, eventually got help from interlibrary loan as well. Like I, I dealt with them when I absolutely had to. I had some issues with the first exam that I tried to get brailed and so I did a lot of my exams orally which is certainly not my my preference but um I will say that I did sort of develop a, a process and in my third year I had a professor who was blind so that course was kind of great because I had everything in braille never had to explain anything to him but um I would say that again the challenge was that I like Ashley I didn't know that I was going to have to do do all of this stuff for myself and um you don't really know i mean this, this is so, so trite but you don't really know what you don't know until you realize that something's you you've missed something so once i kind of had a system in place and i'm stubborn so that helps me and i i i think that the fact that i i was well prepared academically was an advantage um but yeah the, it it was very challenging. I will say just really quickly that one of the advantages that I, I think I had, because we're, we're talking a lot about the disadvantages and the disadvantages are very real, but some of the stuff that you do in linguistics involves a lot of diagrams. And of course, that's a challenge visually. And because I couldn't really get a lot of accommodation, I spent time with my professors and, and learned how to describe them verbally to the point where that, and that was how I did my exams. to the point where my classmates ended up calling me for help because I could explain to them what they needed to draw. And it was, it, it ended up being very helpful to them. So it kind of, on one level, it worked in my favor because it forced me to have an understanding of stuff that I may actually not have had if I could just look at a diagram. Thanks, Jen. You heard it here first, everyone. Stubbornness as a feature. Absolutely. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how my parents will feel about that. You can talk to them <laughs> separately. Thanks, Jen. Um, Leticia, over to you, uh, talking about transition into post-secondary from, uh, from secondary school. My transition was challenging because I went from a place where I didn't have to worry about my course materials. I didn't even have to see the syllabus. You know, somebody else was taking care of it. All I knew before the class start, I have, you know, at least the basic in hand. I really don't have to think about how am I going to describe, you know, if I'm taking biology, will I have the tactile um, document that I need? Will I have my exam in Braille? I just knew it is done. Then I remember my first semester of university, I struggled a lot. I couldn't write any exam using Braille because I have to explain to professors why it's, you know, it has to be transcribed, you know, in Braille. I have to remind them 10 times before they can send it for, you know, to the disability services to be transcribed. And many other times I would get to the, the exam room in the morning just to find out that, oh, sorry, um, miss, I forgot to send you an exam for transcript, you know, to be transcribed. So you can take the exam today and we have to reschedule. It's very frustrating. So I kind of learned that I have to do, besides being a student, I also have to be a kind of administrator for myself. I was the liaison between faculty and disability services. It, it was painful, but 
you know, after two, three semesters, it just, it just becomes normal, but I didn't really enjoy um, the transition at all. Thanks, Letitia. Similar tie back to something Ashley was saying earlier about having to learn, uh, you know, to facilitate things that maybe you hadn't considered previously. Thank you. Um, and Nancy, I wonder if you could provide your perspective just from the service provision side of things uh, in terms of what you've seen as making for uh, more or more or less successful transitions. Yeah, um, so I've been in my position for about 10 years. Um, and in that time, we've always had a like a transition program um, in varying forms. Um, the transition program uh, introduces all incoming high school students, although we've um, added like um, or expanded out to incoming grad and um, adult students. Um, but basically, students who are new to McMaster and registered with Student Accessibility Services. Um, so the program offers courses in the summertime where students can attend a lecture or get an idea of what um, things will be like. Um, so attend a session on note taking or time management um, sessions with student success. Uh, meet other students registered with Student Accessibility Services, and there are, are continuing sessions throughout the academic year, um, like um, like social events and things like that, so you continue that mentorship. Um, and then um, there's, a, like we do a session, like our department does a session on um, what LAS offers, um, textbooks, alternate formats of library material, um, and things like that, like how to obtain them, what's required. Um, the library itself offers a session on um, just how to do research, what's involved with printing, um, sessions like that. And there's a bunch of different departments that they work with. I, I think housing services is also involved. Um, and that's just like for anybody registered with SAS. Um, there's another kind of orientation session um, for, for blind and, and low vision students that um, they work with the, the CNIB's O&M office where they do um, like a campus orientation. So they just kind of like book it. So the student is, you know, kind of, here's the person you need to contact and, you know, whenever it's good for you to, to meet with that person. And then they'll do orientation sessions on, you know, like how to get to your classes um, at the beginning of the, the semester, like towards the end of August. So it's not terribly busy on campus and the person can kind of figure out where the buildings are because it, it's, it's a pretty big campus. Um, and then <clears throat> for the first semester, um, we're, we we did this before COVID. I feel like COVID is kind of like a kind of threw a monkey wrench into things. But prior to COVID, we were doing these sessions with um, the student, the coordinator, uh, the instructor to kind of sit down and say, OK, what kind of accommodations are needed? Um, what, what are you doing? Like, is there a lab involved? Um, is there um, some sort of um, uh, field trip? Um, you know, like, what can we do to make this um, the best educational experience that we can? Um, and kind of hearing from all parties, like, how, how can we accommodate the student as best as possible? And making sure that the student feels like they have everything that they need. Um, so. We were doing that on a regular basis before COVID. Um, we kind of fell out of it during COVID, and we've started to get into it, like the this this this, this year. Um, so that's kind of what we do at McMaster. Great, thank you, Nancy. Now, in in kind of thinking about um, transition, I think many of the responses pointed not only to materials, but to overall experience. Um, and so this next question really speaks to that. So uh, we're gonna kind of step aside from the materials provision piece for just a moment um, and ask the question outside of textbooks, um, which supports did you uh, receive or wish you would have received? Um, and now, Learning materials, I suppose that could certainly apply as well, but we're just, we'll step aside from like those formal textbooks for a second. Um, so Ashley, what supports did you receive or wish you would have received outside of, of the provision of accessible format texts? Um, so I, um, 
I one of the one of the supports that I received that was extremely helpful um, was sort of funding around um, assistive technologies. That was um, that was that was critical uh, to my to my survival and and still is um, as a student. Um, and so I know that that happens in different ways and through different means, depending on where you are in the country. Um, but that's, you know, something else to kind of to be be conscious of. Um, it's something else that does, you know, like everything else involve kind of paperwork and administration and planning and explaining what you need and why. Um, but, you know, I've, I've kind of witnessed all kinds of things that that can be provided that, um, you know, that will that will support uh, students in their in their learning journeys. And so for me, that's been, you know, primarily like, um, you know, laptop computers with screen reading software with kind of OCR or optical character recognition software. Um, back in the olden days, about 20 years ago, I had a scanner I was scanning a lot of um, course materials myself because they were late and I needed to read them, you know, last week, not three weeks from now. Um, and so I would, I would use those. Um, I had some kind of mobile scanning and, and OCR technologies that I was given access to, um, braille displays, embossers, things like that. And so that's the, um, that's a super critical kind of part of the part of the experience as well. Um, and I, I just think too to kind of you know to think about these these processes for for providing supports for for students and don't just think about kind of the textbooks um, because that's, I feel like that was kind of the key aspect when I would have, you know, discussions with access, kind of accessibility services and things like that. We were thinking about kind of success in, in classes in terms of textbooks, but there's so much else that's going on in class um, that students might need support with. And so oftentimes I didn't necessarily have kind of, you know, um, audio description for film content. I did some like literature and film study courses way back when, um, and nothing had audio description. Um, so I used to go like download screenplays so I could get a sense of what was going on. Um, even just kind of things around, you know, um, being expected to do research for assignments and kind of not being provided with accessible library instruction for how to handle search platforms and things like that. A lot of these things are being handled better in some places now than, of course, they were kind of 10, 20 years ago, but um, it's it was still kind of an important lack uh, that I that I noticed. Thanks, Ashley. Um, Jen, similar, que same question to you. Um, outside of textbooks, which supports did you receive or wish you had received? Uh, wish I had received exams. I know I kind of talked about that. Um, the one service that that was uh, pretty good was um, the option to have some volunteer readers. And so they would record, okay, again, here I am dating myself. They would record, um, in my program, we read a lot of art research articles. And so they would record them on, on cassette. And so that was a good, um, that was a good, um, a good service that was offered. And um, technology wise, there was a lot less available. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I would say like in my fourth year, I started, I, my mom co-signed a bank loan for me and I bought a standalone scanner and just bought my own textbooks. And that, that made a big difference. I think assistance at the library could be a little bit of a challenge because again, it wasn't just about being able to use the technology they had because that wasn't even an option back then. I really needed somebody to actually help me get the research materials and then figure out how to get them accessible. So kind of that, the research, um, those kind of pieces around the edge, but definitely volunteer readers were very helpful back then when we had no, you know, now we have a lot more technology to, to help with that kind of thing. Thank you, Jen. Uh, more of a technology focus there as well. Um, Leticia, uh, outside of those textbooks, which supports did you receive or which did you wish you received? Um, I can't remember the one that I received, but I will talk about the one that I wish I received. I really wish I got some orientation and mobility training because I um, often got lost both in the snow and in summertime because it was difficult to locate things. I was living just like two blocks away from the campus, but um, it took a couple of semesters to get used to the campus because I didn't get any mobility training. And I really, I wish I had received some. I know nowadays in universities, they 
do help student student like a few weeks before um, the semester starts. But at the time I took my, I entered university almost 20 years ago, um, I, that service was not available. The other thing, as Jane said, having somebody at the library who could help students with disability would have been uh, something that, I, you know, some, it's something I would have loved to have because many of times that we go to the library to do some research and most databases were not accessible. So I often need somebody and then you come in the evening to do your research because it's quiet. There is only one person there who doesn't even understand how screen reader works. So it becomes like, I can't help you, I'm sorry. Then you go back home not knowing how am I gonna do this re research. After two semesters, I just have to hire a student on my own to help me with research, which I think if university was able to provide me with some uh, some kind of assistance, I would not you know burn my little savings. Right. Thank you, Leticia. And um, Nancy, um, outside of the provision of of accessible texts, um, where are some supports that you see as being successful, and and where is there room for growth? Um, so just just to kind of take a step back, I, I think it's kind of interesting that, that Jen mentioned um, the volunteer readers and um, like human narrated um, texts as um, something that that she was in receipt of, because that's something that we are not able to provide now um, or, you know, like that it's it's challenging to get uh, to obtain human narrated texts. Um, because it, it's such a digital environment. Um, and that's something that um, I do get a request for quite frequently from my students. And I just think it's kind of ironic that um, we've come so far and yet it's it, it, it's almost like a step back. So I just, I, I just wanted to comment on that. <laughs> but um, so I think some of the things that we do like within LAS, um, we have like um, a study space, we call it CATS, Campus Accessible Tech Space. Um, and it's a place that students could come. Um, it's a quiet study space, but there is a, like an AT lending library. So if students wanna come and test out um, technology before they put in for a bursary or they have to buy it, they're able to do that. Um, we also have like a, an area in like a different room where there's a CCTV, there's a scanner. Um, so if they wanna like scan their own textbooks, that's possible as well. Um, we also provide or produce or obtain, that's the right word, um, describe video. Um, so there's two kind of streams. If it's something required for a course, then that goes through um, SAS. But if it's something that the library um, holds, then we'll produce, like we do that through LAS. Um, and then we also obtain alternate formats of library material. Um, so that could be journal articles or uh, library books. Um, and then we, we also, we're working on research help. Um, so th that's kind of challenging because of the number of people that are involved. Um, but we've been working on a project for the last year or so um, to include in our um, journal database section where students can like check off. I would like, you know, accessible PDFs or um, um, captions if, it, if there's videos involved so that if, if a student is doing the research themselves, that is an option that they can do within the, the search uh, parameters. Um, but also, it's, it's also training the, the staff that are doing research help. Um, and that's definitely something we could do better. Okay, thank you, Nancy. So with with that, we're we're kind of shifting our our focus, if you've noticed, onto kind of campus life more broadly. Um, you know, started with materials, and 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 now we're kind of broadening our scope a bit. Um, let's talk now about Braille um, as part of the post secondary experience outside of the classroom. So the question is this: uh, Is was Braille in your experience part of the post-secondary experience outside of the classroom? If yet, tell us about it. If yes, sorry, tell us about it. Uh, if no, uh, please describe where it may have been useful. So essentially what the question is, is how could Braille, how, do, how does Braille factor into campus life and how could it factor into campus life? Um, so 
Uh, kind of a multi-part there, uh, Ashley, Jen, Letitia, and Nancy. So please let me know if you need me to restate any of that. I'm, I'm happy to. But uh, first, we'll go to you, Ashley. Um, so one of the one of the cool ways that I got to use Braille um, outside of classes um, was as part of uh, as part of choir. Um, so choir was an extracurricular that I had kind of you know constantly been a part of um, throughout high school, um, and so I was you know, not a music student um, when I when I arrived at university and I, I, I never kind of formally studied music, but um, students from other faculties other than the music faculty were, <clears throat> excuse me, were able to audition uh, for choir. And so um, I, um, I, I chose to do that. And um, I think for two or three years of my, my undergrad, I, I participated. Um, and, and it was, exciting to be able to um to kind of access um we didn't always have kind of the 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 score or the or the sheet music available in braille um but you know even being able to kind of get the upcoming kind of music sets for a for a concert a couple months out um and get those um produced uh, in braille even just for the texts um was 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 super helpful um, so I really kind of appreciated having having Braille in that in that context. Um, and again, I think to, you know, to make that even better, to be able to kind of get the kind of the sheet music for a specific part um, of the score would have been would have been super useful. Um, and I, I just want to I know that others will probably have lots to talk about in terms of Braille and wayfinding on campus, but um, when I first kind of started 20 years ago, there there wasn't really any Braille signage on campus at all. Uh, there might've been a couple, the odd elevator that had um, some some Braille next to the, next to the controls. Um, but gradually as they were kind of updating buildings, there was some, some Braille signage that was added to some of them. Um, and the, the Braille signage is like insanely useful on campus because think about how a campus works. You have a semester, you have to go to certain places during that semester, and then after like 16 weeks, it all changes again and you have to go someplace else. And especially when you have new students, um, especially when they're new kind of incoming undergrad students, they're probably going to have to go all over campus because usually at the very beginning they're taking, they're not just taking kind of their required courses in their department, they're taking a whole bunch of kind of electives or courses that are required for their major from other departments and, and you know, typically they're going all over campus. So there's a lot of travel right at the very beginning, um, which is, which is stressful. And then, you know, once you get used to it, they snap, it's like musical chairs, time to time to find new buildings and new classrooms and things like that. Um, and, you know, so figuring out like you've got to the right building, you've got to the right floor, um, you know, you could figure out which room is like, you know, 409, but now you can't because there's there's no signage. Um, that's a huge, that's a huge problem. And so I've seen real inconsistencies in some buildings having signage and other buildings not. Within the same building, some floors having signage and others not. Um, I've seen signage that existed but was covered up by like posters and like, I don't know, all kinds of stuff that people just feel free to place over top of the Braille signage, um, which I always felt a sort of gleeful rebellion and just ripping off the wall because um, I knew the sign was under there. It just all sorts of things. So like, you know, really like I would I would love to encourage a respect for, for Braille and wayfinding and signage in particular. I know signage is not a new fancy concept for us to discuss, but you know, I'm here to tell you that people actually use it. Um, and it's 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 critical for people to be able to find their 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 way through buildings that they, you know, keep having to learn um, or experience new ones. Ashley, gleeful rebellion. I've <laughs> written that down, underlined it three times. Amazing. Love that. Jen, over to you. Well, I'm glad I was on mute because I was, that made me laugh out loud. Um, and I completely, completely agree with Ashley's comments on signage. I, there, there wasn't any really in my day and uh, it would have made a really big difference. Tied into that and what uh, Letitia said in her um, earlier comment, like a braille map, tactile map, or even a model, because again, O&M, you know, I had, a very little bit of O&M. I kind of learned as I went. I thankfully had made some friends who were very helpful and helped me 
you know, I, I kind of told them, this is the kind of information I need. And they kind of became uh, temporary o &M instructors. <laughs> but um, so that that's one area that would have been good. Braille, uh, cafeteria menus, things like that would also have been very helpful. One thing that I did have that I guess is not really the onus of the university, but was really part of campus life at that time. I had my mom, um, my mom knows Braille. And uh, so I got letters and cards from my mom. And, you know, everybody in university, you're getting packages in the mail, and my mother would label things in the packages. So I kind of still got that experience. And I had a couple of the friends I made in university wanted to learn Braille. So I taught them. And so they would sometimes uh, write notes and things to me. So that was kind of where I was able to have Braille in my, uh, my experience sort of outside of academics. Very cool. Thank you, Jen. And yeah, cafeteria menus, like just that's a, that's a, that's a really great suggestion. We're just thinking I would have, haven't thought of that. Um, I'm all about food. Yeah, no, well, I, I mean, <laughs> a lot of us are. <laughs> um, thank you, Jen. So uh, Leticia, to you, uh, the, was Braille a part of your experience outside of the classroom? If it was, we'd love to hear about it. And, and if not, do you have ideas on, on how Braille could be um, uh, better factored into campus life? Um. No, Braille was not. Um, but to add to what Jane and Ashley just said, I would like to say at my time, I wish uh, students, just basic students newsletters was in Braille because I could not access it. And that's where you could learn about anything happening on the campus, like parties and new discount. And, and I did not have access to all of those um, little services that other students ha have, different competitions going on and awards and bursaries. I did not have access to all of those because it was not printed in Braille. I remember going for a facial one day just at the end of semester and I went for a facial. And along the line, the institution realized that I was a student and she, she said, well, you know, you have 30% off. I was surprised and I said, oh, I didn't know. And she said, well, it's right there in your agenda last page. So I looked at her weird, her weird like, but I can't read it. So meaning there were many other services that were, we were, all students have asked, you know, had discounts, but I could not, because I did, I couldn't read the agenda. And from what I heard later, it was, you know, at the be beginning of each semester, it was published in the, you know, the student, uh, newsletter, but because I couldn't read it, it wasn't in Braille. So I spent three and a half years there not knowing what was available to me just because I could not access access the basic newsletter. Thank you, Leticia. That, an, another on similar line to what Jen mentioned, something that may often be overlooked in terms of um, making that accessible. Thanks for calling that out. Uh, Nancy, your, your thoughts? On, on how Braille factors into campus life outside of the classroom? Um, <clears throat> so some of the things that, that we've been a part of um, is actually creating the menus um, for hospitality services. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting that Jen brought that up. Um, we've also created or um, purchased um, Braille overlays. We have in our CAT space, we have games that students can either uh, play in CATs or can borrow. So um, we've purchased um, their accessibility um, packages. Um, and so most of our games have the accessibility overlays, um, which is a tactile component. Um, so students can borrow these games and, and take them home and play them with their friends. Um, I think we have like four or five games um, and they're like popular games. Um, uh, Turo is one of them. Um, I'm trying to think, I, I can't remember all of the games that we have, but but they were kind of like the top five games in 2018 when we first opened Cats. Um, and um, we do, um, I completely agree with what Ashley was saying with um, with the, the signage around campus. Um, you know, as, as new buildings are being built, 
um, they're, they're being built to code, they have braille signage. Um, elevators, as they're being refurbished, they're being refurbished with braille signage. Um, floor uh, announcers or the, the um, things that speak out the floor levels um, are also being added. Um, but the old buildings, and I mean, some of our buildings are like over 100 years old. Um, those ones don't always have consistent braille and students still need to go in those buildings. So um, I absolutely can understand the, the frustration of, hang on, where am I? Um, what is this building? Why is there not braille? Um, and I think that needs to be, um, you know, th those, you know, rooms also need to have braille on, on the outside and that, that level of consistency. Um, as we're, we're creating new spaces, like um, we have a new testing center in SAS, that testing center has uh, like a braille sign outside of it. Um, our cat space has a braille sign on the outside of it. So those those spaces are also being, um, I wanna say like announced with braille um, for accessibility, consistency, that sort of thing. But I'm not sure if that's just because of the people that were like working with, or if that's a consistency across campus. Um, so, so that's kind of what we do. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, that, that consistency piece, absolutely key. All right, gang, we're getting to a point where we've, we've been on this journey together and, and your responses have all kind of woven together uh, some, really, some really positive affordances and some places where, um, you know, as a, as a, as a system, uh, we certainly need to, to do better. Um, but we want to end, or at least end our planned program with, uh, with a, with a, a question on, uh, on your ideal experience. And so, you know, we've talked about the, the kind of realities, um, of our experience of, of your experiences rather. Um, but if, if you, we want to give you each the opportunity right now to just share with us a little bit about what an ideal post-secondary experience would be, not only in terms of accessibility, but um, characterized more broadly. Um, so we encourage you to think big, uh, and you've got as much space and time as you need. Uh, thankfully, we did leave a fair amount of, of, of time in our, in our panel discussion for this question. Um, so, Ashley, over to you. Tell us about your ideal post-secondary experience. Um, okay, so I will try to keep this organized and coherent and, you know, concise um, and prevent it from getting, you know, stream of consciousness, but um, I don't get asked this question very often <laughs> um, or questions like it. So, um, the one kind of thing that is is difficult to describe but that would be kind of part of an ideal post-secondary education experience for me would have been just to be able to be a student um so you know to kind of show up and like do my coursework and do my extracurriculars and you know network and meet people and do all of those things without having this kind of extra workload required that which which everyone here has talked about today about kind of you know um having to kind of advocate because advocacy is a really valuable skill set but it's exhausting it's emotionally and kind of intellectually exhausting to have to tell people over and over and over again for years of your life the same thing um and, you know, sometimes the same people over and over and over again um, for years of your life, the same thing. Um, and so, you know, it can feel like you're kind of screaming into the void a little bit um, and it can be an isolating experience. Um, there's just kind of so much more, you know, paperwork and meetings and, and things like that that are that are involved. Um, and it, it if, you know, I would I. It's, it's possible to do and it's worth doing. It's just that in an ideal world, those things wouldn't be happening, right? Students would be students and they would just be, you know, doing their thing and just like, you know, just like everyone else. Um, and I think the other piece of this that's, that's similar is that in an ideal setting, um, we wouldn't be having to explain some things that are pretty basic. So, you know, arguing for why you need something in Braille over a different type of format 
or in Braille when someone else that the staff are aware of who took that course five years ago didn't need it in Braille, um, or just these these sorts of things that that come up that that shouldn't be. That I think that would be just like the absence of those things would be ideal for me. So you know I shouldn't have to explain kind of what we've been explaining before about why being able to read room signage is important. That should be obvious. People need to know where they're going, right? Um, you know if I need um, a particular book in Braille instead of um, uh, instead of you know read by a read, read by a screen reader. Um, I shouldn't have to kind of come up with like lists of criteria for why I need that, which I've had to, to do before. If I need a Braille display, um, I shouldn't have to you know argue that I don't need both a Braille display and a screen reader. Um, so, I mean, this is <laughs> my coherence is 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 fraying again just because it's. Um, it, you know, it's some of this kind of shows me how how far we still have to go to to think about some of these ideals. But I really do hope that just because I have to like always have to end on a positive spin, I really hope that some of the things that folks you know were wanting 20, 30, however many years ago, um, exist now. So you know, Jen and I talked about like kind of scanning books or not having technologies that are able to access electronic things. Those those are things that you know I would have been kind of super excited they would have seemed super kind of futuristic or whatever back when I was you know back when I was 18 and so the fact that we have some of those things now is is movement in a good direction um but there's still just so many other pieces especially kind of just attitudinal um pieces that I find are very very much slower to slower to adjust thank you Ashley and just while we're on while we're st we still have you, Ashley, can I can I ask a small follow up slash elaboration question of you? Something sure. you mentioned. Did you find in your experience that you were often having to disambiguate your unique experience from, let's say, a student who had, you know, had a similar but an identical access profile, maybe from five years or ten years prior? Like, was that a relatively common experience for you? Because I, I heard you mention that, and I I was curious. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think I had mentioned that um, as as an as an asset that there were other kind of especially during my undergrad there were other um, other students who were blind and visually impaired who attended the same institution and that was you know nothing but a, a blessing for me, um, but that also meant that you know those students had their particular kind of learning modalities and also just like we're studying different areas, um, and you know sometimes um, sometimes yeah sometimes those kind of students' ways of being and doing things were sort of kind of presumed onto me. I don't really know how to how to describe that in, in a good way. But yes, I, I find sometimes I have to explain why, you know, the way someone kind of went through some particular course wasn't going to work for me. Um, you know, I'm very, very poor at doing exams orally. I cannot dictate right to save my life. Um, I, you know, I need to be able to, to write things down. I need to be able to take notes. I need to be able to do all kinds of things. And that was, that was, you know, always, always an issue, but especially I think when it came to really complicated things, so like, uh, maths or sciences, in my case, it was like statistics courses and things like that. And students may need different, different kind of pieces from one another. So, I mean, like if your faculty or if your staff, like listen to the specific student that's, that's in front of you and, you know, don't just assume that you can follow whatever recipe somebody was following five years ago. Right. Thank you, Ashley. Appreciate you entertaining my follow up there. Um, Jen, let's talk about your ideal post secondary experience. Meandering answers are permitted. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, the first thing I would say is lots and lots of Braille, whatever I needed in Braille or wanted to have in Braille. Uh, I feel like sighted students never have to say like no no it's not that I just want it I really need it so I would love I would love an ex university experience where I did not have to fight um, and maybe fight isn't really like it's advocate but I, I had to be very persistent and very forceful especially because I was studying um, you know some of the stuff I was studying particularly the languages I really needed Again, and I'm even using the same language. I really needed, I really needed Braille. So um, lots of Braille, textbooks on time. That would have been fantastic. I think one of the things I would have found, I, I mean, I totally agree with, with what Ashley was saying, this not having this extra part-time job of having to do your own 
um, advocacy and, and all your own negotiations. I mean, that would have been great, but I think if, if, um, you know, and again, we're going, we're going back because, you know, my, I started university, you know, in the last century, as I like to say sometimes, because I don't know, makes me feel really old. Um, but having somebody at the, um, and I can never remember what they're called, the, like just the student disability services who really understood, not that they have to understand me exactly. I mean, they can't know everybody specifically, but you know, a braille reading student comes in and this person goes, oh, okay, well, this is what we need to do. And here's what I need from you. And here's what I can do for you. And here's how we're going to make this work. Somebody to kind of walk through the process with me, somebody that I felt was on my side, as opposed to, I almost felt like we were, again, adversaries might be too strong, but it was like, they wanted me to just say that audio was, was good and audio was really not good. So I didn't really feel like I had somebody who was in my corner. And I, I, I think that, that that would have been very helpful um that would have contributed to me having sort of an ideal um experience and i think although the onm is sort of a side point in a way because we're talking about braille and i'm a big picture person so knowing how to get from a to b isn't enough for me i need to see the big picture and that's why i mentioned earlier too about like a tactile map or a, or a model because i i didn't like that feeling of having to put so much energy into just getting to a class that I had never been to before because sometimes the classes change at the last minute and you literally get to your expected room and there's a sign on the door that says okay we're going somewhere else at the other end of campus so just some of that stuff would have made a difference but honestly if I could have one thing it would be it would have been the braille right well as much as we appreciate that direct connection back to the topic of the of the panel Totally appreciate your point on the kind of the bigger picture uh, as well with orientation and mobility and, and other services. Thanks, Jen. You're welcome. Leticia, um, over to you around your ideal uh, post-secondary experience. Actually, I will borrow um, Ashley's expression of, I would have loved to be a student mm. and get my textbooks on time. <clears throat> just come to the classroom know, knowing where I'm going. I would have not, you know, I would have lo loved not to have that extra job of reminding the teacher, can you send the exam on time to be transcribed? Not ha having to carry that burden, that stress, like, am I going to be able to write the exam tomorrow or not? Did the teachers, you know, communicate with disability services? Am I going to get my textbooks on time? You have to explain yourself why you need Braille, why you don't need Braille, why you need a tactile uh, map, why you don't need it. And it's almost like you spend three and a half years explaining yourself every single semester. I wish I was just a student. I was able to just go to class, get the books like everyone and participate because the other thing with some teachers, they will never make you let you participate it's almost like i mean i wish somebody has taught them a little bit about um what you call sensitivity training you know these are all the things that that really weigh me down when i was um university i wish i didn't have to go through all of those and i want to add something it's maybe not part of the um the theme today but i see in most university now you know, accessibility and inclusion statement. And I think like for me, feeling and being a student, just a student like everyone else, that was a way to include me, to feel included. Because when I have to always remind people why I need Braille or why I need X or Y, Z um, service, it make me feel different from the other student, because you always have to stand out and say, I need them, I can't see this. Can you explain, sir? Can you repeat this? What do you mean by here? I, you know, can you explain the, you know, describe the picture for me? So I didn't really feel included. Again, being a student would have been the way to make me feel included and to truly enjoy my time um, at the university. Oh, thank you, Leticia. Yeah, that's certainly something that we've heard, I think, elements of from all of our panelists thus far. 
um, is this, uh, you know, Jen, you put it as like a part-time job um, for, for advocacy and awareness, et cetera. Nancy, in your position, in terms of what you're hearing and the students that you interact with, what would you see as maybe a more ideal post-secondary experience? Yeah, so so this is actually something that we've been working on for a little while. Um, we're very aware that this is a, a burden on students. This is like they're saying, a, a, like a part-time, full-time job. Um, and that's not a burden that other students have that, that you know, on top of being a student, and, and most students also work, um, they also have to manage um, their accommodations. And that's not something that they like really should need to do. Um, so we've been kind of looking at how can we make this easier? How can we reduce the workload for the student? Um, how can we, you know, reduce the touch points and reduce the, the bottlenecks and barriers for these accommodations? Um, I, we really haven't got that far yet. We're still in that, that kind of like examination part. Um, but but it is a work in progress and it is definitely something that we're very aware that it's it's an extra um, it's an extra work that that students shouldn't be thinking about. They really should be thinking about their coursework, their their student job, um, you know, their social life, not, um, you know, I need to think about, you know, did my my instructor submit my text or my test? on time so that I can write with the rest of my class. Um, that shouldn't be something that they should be, you know, stressing about. Um, and it just adds to the, the stress and students are already stressed as it is. Um, so it, it's definitely something that, you know, we're thinking about. Um, in, in my ideal um, post-secondary world, um, it would be that all instructors were hired ahead of time that we didn't have special instructors that were hired the first day of class, um, that instructors posted their course outlines in July so that we knew what the textbooks were. Um, and students chose their courses in like July when like everybody chose, nobody, ch nobody decided to change courses. Um, I didn't have an issue hiring student assistants um, this year I hired seven and I went through 50 plus interviews. Um, I'm not sure what they decided this year, but it was just it, just chaos. Um, and then, yeah, it just went smoothly and we could just produce content and contacting publishers. They were like, yes, here is the file. Um, and as Jen was mentioning, um, uh, languages, uh, I remember a student that was taking a Russian course and they literally could not obtain um, Russian, like like files for this Russian textbook um, to be able to produce it. So it, I just, yeah, I, I think that, you know, certain formats, French is particularly problematic, problematic as well. Um, so I, I think that, you know, those sorts of um, publisher files can be a challenge and would just be wonderful to, to be able to give files to the students when they need it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that would be fabulous. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, being cognizant of time, we have very just a few minutes left, uh, three to be precise, uh, and being respectful of everyone's time. I'm gonna go off script a little bit if I could and ask each of our panelists if they have something to add that maybe we didn't capture, some 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 quick little, little um, some little, like a, a nugget along the line of gleeful rebellion that maybe they haven't had a chance to uh, to 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 share yet. Uh, Jen, I noticed that you've unmuted. Um, yeah, part of it was just trying to be ready in case I got called on unexpectedly. But I would say that what <laughs> I was, <laughs> there's nothing like scrambling at the last minute for the buttons. One quick thing I would say that I found helpful, especially in my mo more recent studies, because technology has made this possible. If you are in a position, and again, you know, this is adding more uh, workload to to us as a learner, but I found that being able to be 
um, being able to do some of my own file conversion, having the software so that I, it gives me a little bit more control when, when the library says it's going to take us a week to get that. And I think, no, nah, I actually need it in two days. If I've got software that allows me, you know, not necessarily to create the perfect Braille formatted file, but something that I can use, I found that being willing and able to do that was, was definitely a helpful thing, especially when it came to things like research articles. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Ashley, I noticed you've unmuted. <laughs> Just super quickly, my kind of message to students is because if you're a student and you're listening to this, especially, you know, for us talking about the bits that are um, that are stressful or complex or whatever. Um, I, I don't want to ever hide that from students um, and, or from new students. Um, it is stressful and it is a lot of work. Um, and, and, you know, us hiding that from you would not be worth your while, but be consistently self-compassionate throughout this process. You can plan everything literally perfectly and be organized ahead of time and do everything right. And sometimes things still don't work out properly. Like I've had this experience multiple times. Um, or you can miss something because you didn't anticipate, you know, you're not master of the universe. You don't have control over everything. There are things you will fail to anticipate. Um, and just be compassionate toward yourself when those things happen because because they will and because you know you being on your own side and not laying it on even worse and you know making things harder for yourself by being hard on yourself is not going to make this process any easier so just be compassionate with yourself about the things that you didn't know you didn't know as jen was was mentioning thank you ashley well and thank you to all of our panelists for everything you've shared today um some incredible insights uh and things to to work on in the future certainly for this uh, diverse audience that we have in terms of uh, various stakeholders uh, in uh, both campus life and uh, in the provision of accessible learning materials at the post-secondary level. Uh, we didn't have an opportunity for general questions, um, but here's an encouragement that I have for everyone who's listening to this or is in attendance right now. Um, this recording will be posted on the Braille Literacy Canada YouTube channel, and we'd like to invite you to use the comment section in that YouTube, um, that eventual uh, YouTube comment section uh, to pose questions to our panelists. And then uh, the organizing committee will just send those on to our panelists and we'll post the answers in that same thread so that uh, we all have the benefit of, of uh, anyone who's, who's watching the video will have a benefit of the questions asked and answered uh, in that comment section. Uh, and so uh, all registrants will receive an email when the recording is posted and we'll encourage you to use that comment section. Um, it may be the first recorded instance on the internet of a comment section being used for the forces of good. So. We'll look forward to seeing you all on there. Uh, want to thank again our panelists. Um, want to uh, thank our organizing committee, all of our our um, our host organizations who came together to make these World Braille Day events possible. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the comments section. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye for now. <laughs>